Good afternoon and welcome to the Design Singapore Council webinar, Delivering on a Sustainable Design Intent. Following through on a sustainable design intent isn't always easy, but there's no time to waste in tackling climate change and other sustainability issues. What are the biggest barriers to achieving more environmentally sustainable buildings, cities, interiors and products? Are there viable ways to overcome the barriers? When do top-down regulations need to be bolstered by bottom-up sustainability initiatives? Today, a diverse panel of designers is tackling the many advocacy, ethical and economic factors at play in the pursuit of sustainable design. This session is being presented by the Design Singapore Council, or DSG, supported by the National Design Centre. As Singapore's National Agency for Design, DSG champions the use of design to grow business, spur innovation and improve lives. We hope to highlight pathways to fulfilling those aims through the crucial lens of sustainable design during today's panel discussion. We are extremely grateful for the participation of an outstanding panel of speakers from the built environment and product sectors. So I'd like to extend our thanks to them for sharing their time and insights today. Razvan Gilik Miku from Hassel, Panyi Cheng from Produce, Emily Sim from Panelog, Yvonne So from the Singapore Green Building Council, and Benjamin Tal from the Building and Construction Authority. I'll let you all know a little bit more about them shortly. I'm Narelle from DSG and I'll be moderating this discussion. And I'm pleased to tell you we've had audience members from around 20 countries register for this session, encompassing designers, design enthusiasts and business executives, which is a really exciting prospect for a diverse and cross-border discussion. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you for joining us and please do send through any questions you might have for the panellists at any point during the discussion and we'll endeavour to get to them all. So from need to have to nice to have. So easily the best intentions can have their associated sense of urgency diminished when inconveniences or barriers to their achievement arise. But how are we all collectively assessing what is acceptable when it comes to sustainability performance in designed outcomes and in the management of how we operate? According to the World Green Building Council, buildings and construction are responsible for around 40% of the world's carbon emissions in the furniture and product industries, with some ex impressive exceptions. It's not always easy for specifiers to access transparent sustainability credentials. While some are certainly making good progress in adopting new processes for sustainability, for many, business as usual continues, even though the prospect of reaching global warming targets seems always further out of reach. When it comes to barriers and inconveniences, designers and all project stakeholders have a responsibility to interrogate, interrogate whose inconvenience is really the issue, ours or future generations. And importantly, what action do we need, be it top-down or bottom-up action, to change our course? Today's session was conceived with the intent of proactive discussion rather than lamentation as a way of getting at the heart of the issue of sustainability for the design industries. We want to look beyond greenwash to the grit of what typically gets in the way of delivering on a sustainable design intent. To do this, we've brought together a spectrum of pro professionals whose activity ranges from the areas of advocacy to policy, practice and production. I'll take a moment now to introduce them by sharing their bios. You'll see some quite solid blocks of text on your screen now, but I'd like to read through our speakers' bios in full in order to accommodate the breadth of their agency in terms of pushing for sustainable outcomes. So do listen in because their, their experience may, might give you some really great fodder for proposing questions to them later. First of all, Razvan Gilikmiku is an associate at Hassel. He's an architect with a keen interest in innovation and agility and an advocate for resilience by design. At Hassel, he's involved in designing new generation working and mixed use environments in Singapore and across Australasia. He's a graduate of Princeton University with over a decade of professional experience in Shang Singapore, Shanghai, New York and Toronto. Rosvan balances practice with ongoing involvement in the Singapore Institute of Architects, where he serves as the chief editor of the Singapore Architect magazine. And he also leads a design studio unit at the National University of Singapore. Pan Yicheng is a design director and co-founder of Produce. 
Established in 2013, Produce was set up as a design studio with a prototyping workshop to deliver highly robust and bespoke design solutions from concept to construction. Since establishment, Produce has completed a number of highly acclaimed projects, including Wild Rocket, Cakey Sweets and the Little Drum Store, and Moniform Living. Prior to this, he graduated with honours from the Architectural Association in London, and he was chosen as one of the top eight UK graduates in 2006. He's accumulated more than 10 years of working experience in the fields of architecture and academia, working with firms such as Arup Advanced Geometry Unit, TP Bennett, Siri Architects and UN Studio. Next is Emily Sim, who's the director of Panelog. The company endeavours to shift production and consumption patterns so that builders, designers and architects can create spaces where ecology and urbanisation can progress in parallel. Having graduated from Singapore Management University and undertaken an apprenticeship in Sumitomo Forestry, Japan, Emily now works with individuals, brands and government agencies on the selection and implementation of sustainable builds and regulations. She currently serves on the board of the Singapore Furniture Industries Council as an executive committee member and previously as an executive committee member of the Singapore Timber Association. Yvonne So is the Executive Director of the Green Building Council, Singapore Green Building Council, or SGBC, which is an industry organisation founded on strong public-private partnership to drive the transformation of Singapore's built environment. Prior to joining SGBC, she established the operations of the Waste Management and Recycling Association of Singapore as its first Executive Director. Yvonne's a registered professional engineer, a civil engineer, and a Greenmark accredited professional. She has an extensive experience with the government sector, having been with the Building Construction Authority for a decade, heading the Centre for Sustainable Buildings and managing portfolios in policy development, regulatory control, industry promotion and research and development. Yvonne's passionate about driving corporate action on climate change and the development of programs to motivate and sustain a virtuous cycle of action. And finally, Benjamin Henry Tao is a senior architect at the Building and Construction Authority. He's an award-winning architect, policymaker, chartered surveyor, and chartered environmentalist. He's a respected thought leader and assessor of buildings and districts for their environmental performance. He's a senior architect within the Environmental Sustainability Group of the BCA, where he's been involved in the development of Singapore's environmental policy within the built environment sector over the last decade, including the development of Greenmark 2015 and directing the response to advancing net zero energy through the Super Low Energy or SLE program. He's also the author of the Singapore Institute of Architects Green Book, and he was previously the chair of the World Green Building Council's Rating Tool Task Group. He currently holds the Urbanisation and Planning Strategy seat on the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors Governing Council. So welcome everyone, and thank you for being here, and let's get into our discussion. I'd like to start by setting the context for our discussion and getting a sense of what each of you are bringing to this conversation through your professional activity. So as I ask questions of each of you, it would be great if you could include your conception of the term sustainability in your response. I'm going to just start with Yvonne. So Yvonne, the Singapore Green Building Council is a non-profit organisation with an advocacy agenda and its own certification schemes for green building related products and services. Could you give us some background on why the Singapore Green Building Council was incepted, under whose charge and what gaps it's been filling in the green building ecosystem in Singapore since 2009? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks, Narelle, for that introduction. Um, well, I guess there are two key reasons why um, the Singapore Green Building Council came into uh, existence. Firstly, in 2005, BCA launched the Green Mark Scheme, which is a framework to rate the environmental sustainability of buildings. And in those early days, uh, there was a great need to learn about and adopt the best practices from around the world. And BCA would convene an international panel of experts every year to advise BCA on the path that Singapore should take. Well, it turned out that uh, almost all of the appointed experts were also local leaders of their own uh, nascent National Green Building Councils. And they encouraged Singapore to set up a National Green Building Council as well. 
as a more efficient and effective way to be connected to global best practices and uh, to keep abreast of the latest developments in green building. So BCA uh, got together a group of um, early Singapore green building advocates, formed a committee of course, uh, provided seed funding and also secretariat support and that's how the Singapore Green Building Council got established in 2009. So um, that's like our short history in a nutshell. Um, but seriously, the second key reason why, uh, next slide please, the, um, why Green Building Councils exist is because um, delivering and operating a green building is a collaborative effort by many different professions and the members of the supply chain where the building is our final collective product. So um, the Singapore Green Building Council is the only organization that brings the various players together in one place, all with the common objective of making an impact and delivering buildings that are more environmentally sustainable for the benefit of people. Our members come from all sectors, including also the financial institutions uh, recently. And uh, I would say diversity is the strength of our membership and we use this strong point to facilitate conversations and partnerships. Yvonne, thank you for um, your response to that first question. I'd like to ask you okay. why did the Singapore Green Building Council see the need for its advocacy and certification schemes and why, why is S Singapore Green Building Council the right body to administer them? Okay, so well, um, the Green Mark scheme was established by uh, BCA in 2005 and it uh, very quickly, I mean BCA very quickly got uh, inundated by requests for meetings from solution providers who were very eager and excited to share their ideas and technologies to deliver better buildings and push the envelope for green. So it quickly became um, apparent that a central repository was needed to sieve out the suitable solutions for Singapore and to create an efficient marketplace for green building products to connect with specifiers and uh, project teams. Um, we also have to bear in mind that uh, Singapore, in Singapore, we, we manufacture hardly anything, right? So we have a wide choice of products from across the world to bring to Singapore and to choose who we want to do business with. So do we want to be a responsible global citizen and support businesses that are operating sustainably and manufacturing products that are to the best of standards? that will enable our buildings to perform better or do we want to settle for less? So I think that's uh, something that we um, asked ourselves and that's why the product certification was uh, created. Um, for our services certification, uh, that's for professional consultancy and contracting firms. And this was launched two years after the product certification scheme. Uh, it was a natural progression as green building gained traction and uh, building developers and owners, not just in Singapore, but uh, also in the Asia region, wanted to know uh, what firms had the capabilities and expertise to, develop, to deliver green buildings the Singapore way, which is uh, a building that responds to and fits the tropical belt that uh, we are in. Uh, our latest certification program is the Green Mark uh, Accredited Professional Program, which is the professional qualification scheme for building, prof uh, building professionals to profile their capabilities. Uh, and then to your second question, which was uh, about whether we are the right body to administer these schemes, I guess uh, I would say yes, because of how we are set up. We don't represent any one particular profession or trade, so we have no obligation to promote any particular sector. And also we have very strong support and participation from the public sector. So uh, if you look at our board, every single um, public sector member on the board were elect was elected in by uh, our members. And uh, during elections, they also have to provide their election manifesto just like everyone else. Okay, that's good. Um, some accountability there. Good to hear. <laughs> okay, I'm going to um, uh, throw over to Ben now. And Ben, I'd like to ask you, about the SIA Green Book that you authored. And what was the vision that you had when you authored that book for the Singapore Institute of Architects? Because when I read it, what I'm reading is a really urgent call to arms. 
Yeah, um, essentially that's that's what it is. It was um, a, a call to arms for the profession at large, um, given that architects are involved um, throughout the project, you know, for its entire life uh, in many cases, you know, other consultants come and go, but the architect will, will have that site or be involved, you know, across the lifespan of, of many buildings and many projects. So it also positions the profession as being aware and engaged uh, with the, the the full issues of sustainability, but it's not just about being aware and engaged, it's also about ensuring that there is a, a positive response and action um, to the facts that are out there. The, the book is also quite important in that it, it features a lot of projects, you know, from the local fraternity, demonstrating that the Singapore architect is already skilled at addressing these issues, and it highlights some beautiful projects from all sides of practices, from your one one man sole proprietors uh, uh, through to your, um, you know, uh, locally established uh, multinationals. So it, it, it kind of covers all of that. So next slide. Um, the, the book, next slide, uh, the the book provides an overview of, of climate change as well uh, as developments in international environmental law uh, and of, of course uh, the finance industry which are normally considered in silos and separate subjects and something that the profession at large be it architects engineers tend not to get involved in those discourses and, and stay a little bit away from from those worlds so it provides a commentary on how those are all interrelated the changes that are occurring across those different spaces and and how it's coalescing into the professionals world and and it's a kind of we need to t keep track of this we need to be aware of this uh, and those that start to engage in this will actually see the benefits uh, and those that don't could be in for a rough time both professionally uh, in, in terms of future liabilities and in terms of accountability and in terms of you know understanding the market and getting projects so next slide um, but beyond the theory um, the we, we have the EDGs which are the environmental design guidelines now these provide practical uh, guidance for both projects uh, and the practice itself for the implementation of the new urban agenda and the, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which a lot of people talk about, but they're all very kind of up there, macro level objectives. And it's how do we bring that down into professional practice? It's distinct from a rating tool. We're not talking about a rating tool here. We're talking about attitudes, behaviors, decisions, discussions, and things like that. So on the next slide, you can see what those actually are. So it's, it labels us to have a template to uh, demonstrate our role uh, in bringing the SDGs into life, into all of our projects, uh, and, you know, a guideline for us to measure what success is, communicate with our clients, uh, and work with our practice uh, and our allied professionals to, to connect and, and utilise and join the dots and, and work out how things all go together. And, and finally, um, on the last slide, um, you know, these are some of the project images that you'll see throughout the book, um, but it, it provides a critique. So it doesn't try to hide uh, that, you know, architects, in fact, the built environment industry across the entire value chain, it, you know, much of our work is entangled with and complicit uh, to the multiple uh, drivers of earth system destruction. And we haven't been sufficiently ambitious to deal with this, you know, as, as a fraternity, uh, and I still think that we're not. So we kind of need to look at those roles that we have in urbanization and economic growth and, 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 and what is the role that we want to play. And we can't preserve the status quo. So the, throughout the book, you know, it really identifies that we cannot preserve the status quo of practice. Uh, if we do, we need to be comfortable that we are uh, and, and accept the responsibilities that we are preserving the root causes of the you know, socio-ecological destruction and crisis that we find ourselves in today. That's it. Um, I found it quite exciting to, to read this kind of position from a professional institute, so I think that's a, a tremendous step. Ben, you've been a critical actor in the ongoing development of the BCA's Green Mark Rating Scheme and the push toward net zero buildings with super low energy. So why are top-down incentives a necessary part of the green building ecosystem in your point of view? Um, well, 
I mean, let's let's be honest. We don't. The market doesn't value um, good necessarily in in the full terms. There's a there is a disconnect between uh, environmental concerns and damage and and the cost of things on the value of things. That's why we have a proliferation of cheap disposable items. You know, go to the hawker center. You know, sometimes it's actually more cost effective for the hawker to give you things in disposables uh, rather than in a reusable plate, which then has manpower to clean and things like that. So the value system that we have in place doesn't quite communicate the real cost of environmental damage um, of many of our activities, products, services, and, and approaches. And, and don't forget the, the, the kind of whole carbon-based economy has been around since the Industrial Revolution. So that that's had you know, almost a century, uh, well, more than a century, sorry, now, uh, to, to work out how to be very efficient at pricing things and valuing things through that way without those considerations. So. Uh, you know, to steer that ship to a new economy is going to take a lot of time. As such, top-down regulations and top-down incentives are required to plug that gap, to to start to, to move that juggernaut a different way, which wouldn't happen uh, naturally otherwise due to that disconnect between uh, value uh, the, and real value and, and, and real cost versus perceived value and perceived cost. And on the topic of incentives, I personally don't like incentives. I, I think it's actually a bit, it's a bit addictive. Um, you know, it can change the market to be, I need an incentive for this or I'm not going to do it kind of mindset, which I'm not a fan of. But then again, I understand the need for it. It, it is that recognition of value to try and, you know, push that something good, which wouldn't happen otherwise in the current market mechanisms um, to get over that initial risk, to give the proof of concept. And, and in something like a building, there is high risk because it's not a product that's going to be in your pocket for a year or two years. It's something that's going to be there for decades. So any fundamental change in the way that we do things has an inherent risk. Uh, and also a lot of a lot of cash with it, so that's kind of why we need quite a lot of top down. But of course, that doesn't and shouldn't inhibit a bottom up approach as well. Mm. Yeah, the the risk part is yeah an, an important point that you've raised, and um, mm -hmm. especially in terms of how we view the time scale of projects and what our roles are. So one one last question for you at the moment, Ben. What knock-on effects have you seen Singapore's codes having in terms of elevating the ambition for sustainable urban building or interior design outcomes? So I, I, I'm not here to give everyone a, a, congratulatory, a congratulatory uh tap on the back um, <laughs> but uh you know Greenmark as a whole, whether we love, love it or loathe it, um, has been a linchpin for much of the environmental policy, uh, successful environmental policy that's come out of Singapore. And it has been uh, very useful in attracting international uh, awareness. Um, it's transformed our market quite significantly. Obviously, we have the support of our Green Building Council, which, which help us with that greatly. It's that kind of partnership that brings industry and people together. So as a government intervention, which Greenmark is, it, it's been really successful like that. It's been an agent of change uh, in that policy space. Yes, you could argue that it was too, it is too quantitative. It doesn't value design as much as it possibly could, but, you know, it, it, it brought a lot of people along with that journey and created a new market and a new value system um, for products and services to really start to move things along. And, and in terms of nuts and bolts, you can see that, uh, that there's a, a new vernacular of building that has started to come. It's not mainstream yet. It's in the niches, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. There is that steering of, of a Singapore building. You know, you, when you walk past it, it's got a lot of greenery on the outside. There's a, it started to work with the climate a lot more. It's a lot less air conditioned. It's a lot less of a of an American glass box, you know, built for nowhere, implemented everywhere. It has a, a that real kind of exciting design to it that hasn't really been here since the late 60s, early 70s with the pioneer architects that did the Golden Mile, People's Park, Pearl Bank, which were local uh, vernacular of the modern movement. So we, we're starting to get that now. Um, and I'm not saying that's all down to government policy and all down to green market, things like that. 
but I think Greenmark is helping to, to drive those ideals to that wider audience and providing that recognition. And again, that's the kind of approach which we're seeing regionally being applicable. So our policies, our approach, our ideas, and thus our consultants uh, and the brand SG and those intangible values are being brought out and brought along. So we're seen as a bit of a leader in this front. So it's a great opportunity. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. It's exciting to watch how Singapore architecture is developing with um, vegetation and with climate sen sensitivity. Okay, Razvan, I'm going to turn to you now. The practice that you are right. working in, Hassel, has announced last year that it, in, it had embarked on a carbon neutral roadmap for all of its studios worldwide and the fast tracking of its shift to renewable energy to power its studios. So what prompted these changes to Hassel's practice management? All right, well, that, that's a great question, Narelle. Um, and I, I think the question was prompted by, by an image that was broadcast on our various social media streams, um, I think late last year, announcing the shift. And hopefully we can get the slides up as well um, to see the image. But frankly, that's, that's nothing really new for us because we, we have had a present um, sustainability function in Hassel for, well, more than a decade at this point. And it, it is really about promoting environmental sustainability, not only through the work that we do, but also through the way that we practice in our operations. And a few years back, we, we were already around the 60% mark of, of using renewable energy. And around 2018, we, we started a new sustainability framework. Uh, that encompassed a whole bunch of measurable targets that we were going to achieve. And that was the five-year plan, at least back in 2018, so looking at 2023. But if we go next, the I guess the accelerator, um, and in a way a catalyst, has been some of the natural disasters we have witnessed across the globe. Of course, Australia was on fire about a year ago, and also our increased leadership role in, in this conversation through Architects Declare, for instance. So we decided to actually bring that ambitious 2023 goal forward, um, and our Australian studios have reached it by the end of last year, and we're working towards the rest of our studios um, achieving it by the end of this year. So that's in a nutshell sort of where we came from and what made us push it even harder. Uh, we, we just couldn't wait. You have to lead by example. Here are more firms taking steps like this. Well, and you know, that's, that's pretty hard to gauge. Um, I, I only work for one firm, uh, but I guess extrapolating for our own, from our own journey, um, there is a bit of a lack of easily available information and actually, you have to have, you know, create a deliberate focus on looking for this information. That could be a reason. But for us, I mean, speaking just for ourselves, I can see perhaps two main factors that drove and really enabled this change. And one is, you will see on the slide, that kind of vanished off the screen. And I'd rather very much look at it than at myself. Um, is, is our people. It's been, there's been really tremendous interest from, from staff all across the practice in making this shift. We're talking about my generation, older, and, and, and definitely the younger generation who will have to inherit the mess that's being created right now. And we want to practice in a responsible way. So that's, in a sense, to echo some of the thoughts that Ben had just mentioned is, you know, this, this is a true bottom-up approach where that's how we, to get, as a collective, we choose to practice. But the other one, if we go to the next slide, there's also a top-down. It, it is simply what we do um, as a practice. You know, what's your mission? What's in your DNA? And it could be through the sectors that we are active in. Um, for instance, this one about uh, environment and communities, the projects that we do. That's a screenshot from our website. And also the conversations that we choose to be part of. For instance, Archifest just a few months back. And I guess the danger when you look at it is to really succumb to this fallacy of, oh, we're just the practice, we won't really make a difference. But, you know, leaving it to the other people mentality, you know, they, you know other people can fix it, people with more power, um, people with more agency. Um, so we decided to fight that, very simply. You know, we, we decided to get our house in order first, um, to think global, but really act local. And if everyone does that in their own, kind of gets their own house in order, um, you can imagine as it aggregates to something that could be meaningful. Okay. Um, 
I'm just mindful of time, so I just would ask you quickly to touch on one more question. Hmm. Hassel was hmm. also a founding signatory of the architect's arm of the construction oh. declares movement in Singapore, which has spread from the UK to, I think, 26 countries so far. So could you tell mm -hmm. us about Hassel's commitment to that declaration mm -hmm. and why the firm is taking ground up steps like that? Okay. So yeah, we, 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 we did join the UK charter with our architecture and landscape architecture teams. Um, if you go next slide, please. We, we are amongst the seven uh, local practices founding it here in Singapore. We're also a founding member in Australia. And Architects Declare is really, we saw it as a rallying point for architects to come together to try to, to address these issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. And although the commitments are somewhat aspirational, um, they're entirely worthwhile. Um, and is the way we choose to practice and chose to practice even before aligning with Architects Declare. And joining it is also about catalyzing and encouraging other parts of our industry and other practices. So if you go to the next slide, I'll give you a peek behind the curtain. Um, you know, the commitment, going back to the first question you asked, you know, commi committing to something that's somewhat measurable, these targets, is also a good chance to figure out how to get there you know, with intent and some level of accountability. And here you can see an actual extract from the sustainability framework of how we run our internal design reviews for every single project in the studio. So developing that internal compass was really crucial to promoting a mindset that is genuine and, and not expect that complying with codes is enough. And again, I'll have to bracket that with the fact that we do practice um, across various jurisdictions and codes vary, but having that internal authentic compass is really core to how we design and how we choose to walk our talk. Okay, thank you, Razvan. Yicheng, I'm going to turn to you now. So, Yicheng, your studio produce is currently undertaking research via DSG's Good Design Research Program, and this is for the development of a mass engineered timber product. Yicheng, could you tell us about that and what pushed you in that direction and your plans to produce it in Singapore, including the capabilities here for manufacture and workflow? Yeah, so our company, um, we have invested in um, a prototyping facility for a number of years. So we have always um, practiced based on design and make. Primarily at first it was to overcome the um, the, the shortage of skilled labor, particularly in carpentry in Singapore. And then gradually we turned into um, doing prototyping for uh, larger and larger uh, installations. And now we're looking to um, create uh, outdoor installations as well as buildings. So um, what pushed me in the direction is also to find a kind of synthesis between all the three companies that I have. Um, so Superstructure is doing di uh, digital fabrication. Um, type Zero is my architecture firm and uh, produce as design research. And we, we look for an opportunity to work in the center. Um, so next slide. Um, and um, we have been um, toying around with a lot of uh, kind of prototypes and particularly um, our interest lies a lot in timber. Um, one is uh, because we are limited by the tools that we have. And secondly, uh, it offers uh, the kind of design freedom um, that we can then combine with uh, digital fabrication. And also, uh, timber is the only renewable uh, building material. And um, so for the DSG uh, um, good design research, um, next slide please. We wanted to uh, capitalize on the kind of uh, positive potential of MET adoption. Uh, which is the integra integration of digital design um, and fabrication to assembly workflows, um, increase the productivity and reduction of manual labor and creating a carbon neutral uh, construction method. But um, our product is based on reconstituted timber, which is different from um, normal uh, MET. Um, so what it built upon, uh, uh, the additional advantage is that we want to create something that's self, uh, a rely, a self reliant uh, MET component that is sourced from our region uh, in Southeast Asia uh, using plantation timber such as uh, rubber wood. And then um, it, it will also reduce the plantation to product turnaround time because it's uh, faster to harvest. Um, and then it re reduces the material uh, and increase um, strength to weight ratio uh, for our product. 
And uh, in the end, we want to encourage a more widespread adoption of uh, MET construction in Singapore and uh, within the region. So we go to the next slide. Um, so our aim is really to um, look into uh, reconstituted timber as uh, a base material and allowing for digital uh, tools and computational design to um, create more possibilities. And uh, at the same time, um, to work towards a kind of system and component-based uh, design that will uh, allow a more widespread um, uh, adoption of MET and particularly to replace uh, concrete. I was going to ask you, Yi Ching, um, you're developing this sandwiched variable egg crate structure through your research project at the moment. I'm wondering how, how would that be dealt with at the end of its life and does Singapore currently have the capabilities to deal with a circular approach to mass engineered timber? Um, so for the product that we're looking at, it's uh, reconstituted timber at the end of its life. Um, I mean, the first priority is to reuse. So we want to look at it from a component point of view. So um, for example, um, something like that, which we are trying to fashion into a wall or floor panel uh, can then be reused in another site. Um, then after that, it can be also be broken down and reconstituted with uh, other, other materials to form finishing panels or um, building materials uh, that are of a, a kind of lower intensity in terms of its uh, structural strength. Um, but the circular economy is definitely important, but I think we need to look at the not the end of the cycle, but the, the beginning of cycle, um, which is to first of all, um, look for um, the correct source of um, uh, material from a sustainable source um, and look for materials that are, uh, that contains high recyclable content and low hazardous content. And- um, Is that easily done that are, in this region? Sorry? Is that easily done in this region, finding that sort of source material? Yeah, I think we, we, we first need to start and then there would be a supply when the, the building goes to end of its life, then there would be a supply of recyclable uh, materials that can then be repurposed. But currently, because of the lack of it, we don't have the, the diversity uh, of industries and manufacturing capability to start to look into the, the afterlife of material. So what we are trying to do is completely bottom up in a sense, we are trying to start this process um, by uh, investing our time to research uh, for, uh, into this uh, uh, component, uh, MET component. Yeah. In use, could it be used for furniture or other avenues as well? Well, definitely. Um, our priority is still uh, to to develop materials for um, buildings, um, but definitely it can be used for furniture and uh, perhaps even um, uh, surface finishes uh, or decorative panels uh, within buildings for interior use. Okay, well, all the best with the development of that product, Yi Cheng. Thank you. And now I'm going to throw to Emily. Emily, I'm going to ask a, the first question to you. Could you tell us about the product ecosystem that Panelog sits within here in Singapore and in the region and the steps that you've taken with the company toward an alternative offer to impact? So what, what kind of gaps in the market are you addressing with Panelog? Thanks, Narelle. So the name Panel log is derived from the words panel and dialogue, which means to start a conversation about engineered flat panels. And the meaning is multifold. First, we want people to focus not only on the surfacing material, but what's underneath the furniture, but also the start of conversation about engineered wood be products being an equal alternative to solid wood. So this enables us to extend the possibilities of woodworking. What, what we are doing is to essentially shift the demand for traditionally sought after things like solid wood to what's innovative. So if you may move on to the next slide, most engineered materials come in panel form and it's easy to work off. It's the most sustainable of all being uh, plantation logs and it helps us increase the abilities of wood. Firstly, the yields can be increased from 40 to 60% when we are producing solid wood, but with engineered wood, the yield is often above 90%. 
And with engineered wood, we usually remove all the traditional disadvantages of woods, like its knots and cracks, spreading them out across the panel so you can slice and chip them easily. And it increases the number of applications, and that's why you see like a, a myriad of new like timber skyscrapers that is popping up all over the place. Uh, panel materials are also the most easy to ship, so it really helps us reduce carbon emissions as well. And on to the third slide, you can see that engineered wood products is tailored to all kinds of applications. So for designers, I think it's good to start the conversation and think about how you can express these new details that come along with engineered wood. The material is more stable. We can use them for digital fabrication to generate more complex geometries, or we can work with less material and increase the span of our designs. So at Panelog, we provide this extra consultancy and help for the designers to manipulate these new materials. So Emily, do you think that, that Singapore's furniture sector is doing enough to tackle sustainable production in Singapore and the region? And how about, you know, distribution and life cycles? Um, and is there enough demand from consumers and specifiers for more sustainable offerings? When Southeast Asia is concerned, we are slow to act, but it's definitely a hot topic that is gathering traction. Uh, it's largely led by new rules and regulations, but awareness all takes time. Now. And government agencies and associations have been trying their best to roll out policies, but uh, these policies will sometimes affect the cost of living, so I think it's a precarious balancing act. So despite Singapore being a small country, we are responsible for 1% of the world's furniture production spread across the region. So I think it's extremely important that Singapore companies take the lead in creating sustainable sustainable business models. Where FSI, SFIC comes in is to help Singaporeans, uh, Singaporean companies roll out this and adopt these new initiatives, certificates and best practices set by different organizations across the world so that no one is left behind. And from here, we have the visibility of all Singaporean companies exploring different routes towards a more sustainable and environment, environmental friendly practice. Our members, such as Office Planner, a homegrown furniture supplier, has been applauded by the Singapore Environmental Council for their efforts to go green through the use of recycled materials. They've also been awarded the Green DNA Award for their efforts. And there in the slide, you see another homegrown furniture brand commune who moves not only to have their products crafted with recycled materials and eth ethically sourced wood, but their furniture is also designed with the intention of minimizing waste. So SFIC is currently working to onboard members in view of NEA's new mandatory packaging reporting framework, where producers of packaged products, especially furniture, such big and bulky items will be required to submit packaging data. This will really help companies raise uh, awareness about how much packaging they're using and the benefits of reducing the amount of packaging being used. And regarding product life cycles, I think we can definitely do more. There is really no effective way to simply recycle furniture because the furniture is made up of so many different components that must be stripped away, stripped apart and recycled individually. Designers have a role to play in building making building materials more sustainable by being, making it more durable, uh, more easy to repair, refurbish, reuse and disassemble. So this to maintain their components and their materials to the higher use, highest useful purpose as long as feasible which minimizes resource waste. So the responsibility of end-of-life treatment of furniture is also requires a concerted effort from the consumers to find out best recycling practices and for government companies or companies to make this available option to all of them. So I know it's a tall order, but the sustainable design intent should not be seen as an advantage, but a prerequisite of their design. And sometimes the linkages are not very clear, so maybe I'll highlight a few environmental issues that are connected to a work of an interior designer. For, for example, uh, deforestation, and to encourage like, engineered wood use plantation lot products and use only solid wood where necessary, and ensure that they are produced in a sustainable way. So on the topic of, let's say, like a uh, resource consumption, uh, create like a fashion for minimal, minimal, minimalism is one approach that could be designing for like multi-purpose furniture, kitchen appliances, replace, could be replaced with machines that uh, perform different tasks. So this would minimize the amount of things that we need. 
And of course, uh, waste, as I've touched on before, uh, designing something that lasts with minimal packaging uh, and provide viable disposable options, I feel is something that designer needs to look into. And the less direct uh, kind of uh, linkages can be like carbon emissions, you know, choosing materials that are near where you live, having your production close by, or other creative ways like, you know, creating new uh, things that that help collect rainwater or, or examine like the raw materials that we are using and make sure that their manufacturing process uh, are not polluting the environment. So I think these are important. So if you move on to the next slide, uh, you can see that, you know, manufacturers use so much and, and they need to really innovate through like, uh, yeah, innovate through uh, refining their manufacturing processes, be open to new technologies and uh, make more informed choices. So they are also there to inform and enable designers to create something completely sustainable and different. And lastly, and, and the most obvious reason is to not cut corners. I know that cost implications can be very, very difficult and these decisions to make can be quite uh, a lengthy one. So, I, and the last, and sorry, sorry. Yeah, and the decision that is going coming from the management can be a lengthy one, but I hope that they make the right choices for the environment. And lastly, and the most important point is to educate consumers. So I know that like uh, consumer demand has a great role in driving sustainable offerings and sustainability unfortunately cannot be seen. So usually it's the first to go when we talk about uh, cost cutting for cost conscious consumers or manufacturers. So we hope to change that by being an agent of change, thinking of how uh, designers on, and manufacturers can affect that change. Um, and if you think about it, you know, like we talk a lot about re renewable energy, but nobody talks about renewable building materials, renewable furniture and that kind of stuff. So that has really has to be brought into the limelight so that we can start this conversation about having renewable uh, interior spaces. Yeah, thank you, Emily. So I'm conscious of the time and I'd like to move to the next part of our um, discussion. So for this part, I'd like to really get to the barriers to sustainable design. So it's, I'd say it's really not possible for anyone these days to claim ignorance about the need to combat climate change and embody sustainability. And, you know, there, there are a lot of things to concern us from the prospect of climate breakdown and biodiversity collapse, economic and social collapse that might come with new inequities, um, you know, uninsurability of properties or projects with a high embodied risk that's related to climate change. It's, it's kind of a scary prospect, which Ben was alluding to earlier. So we do need fast and collective action, but not everyone's taking that path and not everyone in the design sectors is either willing or able to advance as needed. So let's talk about the barriers now. I'll throw this question to anyone in the panel. Is upfront project cost really the biggest barrier to delivering on a sustainable design intent? Because it's the factor that I've heard mentioned the most frequently. Why is it often more expensive to take the sustainable route? Who'd like to tackle that? <laughs> Shall I have well, a go? Yes, if I yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, um, well, for us, because we've been at it for uh, 10 years, right, I would say I, I really don't think that uh, cost is a very big issue these days because many corporates are setting sustainability as a key objective now. Um, I find that maybe it's more of if you're using new solutions and uh, innovative solutions, then there's, of course, um, a premium when you, when you try something new. Uh, but cost very quickly comes down with uh, economies of scale. So I think because we certify quite a number of innovative products and in the you know, early days, uh, the companies would tell us there's an issue with demand, but um, schemes like the Green Mark, you know, helps to uh, encourage take up. So uh, one, two years later, when I talk to the same companies, you know, that's not an issue. And I think when it comes to designing a building, it's more about the planning uh, having giving the designers sufficient time to, to plan for a good building uh, and cost is less of a factor, I would say, yeah. Okay. Does anyone else want to field that? 
Yeah, I'll just I'll just add to Yvonne's point. I I, I think that that's right. I, I don't think we can get away from the argument on cost, but it's the argument on cost if you try and do something exactly the same way as as before. So if if you design a big glass tower which is fully air conditioned, and then you want to go, now I want it to be a more sustainable building, then you're going to incur great cost, attack, creating a, you know, trying to solve a problem you have created in the first instance. Whereas if you pull it back to first principles and say, well, actually, if I was to design that project for the climate in which it's... But I think the point is that if you, if you, if you, if you have a problem of your own making and you try and resolve it, yep. it's going to cost you money. If you do it from the fundamental principles, work with the climate, for example, you're going to have something which doesn't cost as much, could be cheaper, um, you know, and much more effective. It's about the sim doing the simple things right, which then allow you to take the risks with new technologies and things like that. New technologies, yeah. yes, they do carry more weight, as everything. But like I say, if you're designing from first principles, you need a lot less of those technologies in the first place. So then you can you have that freedom to experiment, the freedom to apply, and so you can you can do it well without the extra mm -hmm. cost. Yeah, uh, so I, I want to chime in on this one as well. Is is that cool? Oh, yeah, please oh, go ahead. We are yeah, back. I, I, yeah, slowly one by one, right? Um, yeah, I think it's it's also a matter of separating the notion of cost to that of value. Um, I think a lot of times we are somehow conflating the two and they couldn't be further apart. And I think having that real conversation at the beginning or even before the beginning of the project with, um, with your client, with your consultants and really set the direction around that notion of, of a value and a long-term investment because I think a lot of times and perhaps that is decades of being conditioned to practice a certain way, um, there's this bad habit of, of um, starting, like you were saying, Ben, just starting perhaps out of inertia a certain way on a project and then trying to somehow either fix or reverse some of the issues that you come up with or to just kind of, you know, put the bitter pill in an apple pie and try to kind of swallow it that way. Whereas I think sometimes the impatience of, of waiting for for those gains that are actually incremental and they take a long time to manifest versus upfront quick savings is also something that needs a cultural change in the way that we develop um, cities and beyond because obviously capital cost is one, but uh, operational cost life cycle is another thing. So looking at the way that efficient systems that um, somehow in the longer term actually absorb a lot of the upfront cost without producing all the negative side effects can be a strategy that everyone has to have buy-in because again buildings are an investment that is for decades um, and it's not simply a quick um, real estate play you cash out and that's the end of it it's someone else's issue to deal with so it's slightly more systemic um, and i think slightly more complex than just just price uh, price point itself yeah no you're, you're well, absolutely yeah. right value Value is something that is, is, is neglected. The value of good design, the value of doing it right versus the cost. And I, I don't think we do value the value of, of, of good design enough. We can't put a dollar value on it per se as easily when it comes to a, an audit, which is, which is a shame because we should be valuing that, that design, the, the, the lifting of the spirit of a good building versus a, a not so good building, for example. There is a, a value to that. Or there's a value to planting trees along roads. It costs huge amount in terms of upfront and maintenance, but there is an intrinsic value to, to it. So on, on valuing that value, I'd like to ask, um, are there procedural barriers to the financing of sustainable projects? And I'm, I'm wondering about things like the ability to assure or to prove outcomes and things like inconsistencies in how data is collected. So yeah, barriers to the financing of sustainable projects. Can we talk about that? Who's willing to give that one a go? I can, I can give it from a high level point of view, but in terms of financing projects, obviously being in the public 
in 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 the policy area. Um, I, I don't have much direct kind of experience where I can stay where it seems to be going and then hopefully others can, can talk about some of their projects and how those have been financed or the things that they're seeing. But um, in terms of finance, at the moment there's a lot of issues regarding due diligence and obviously but financers don't want to be seen as greenwashing. Um, so they're quite worried about what they invest in when it's said to be uh, something sustainable. So sometimes there's a, a procedural cost um, of actually trying to, you know, prove that something isn't greenwashing versus the actual thing itself. So both in terms of time and, uh, and energy, um, you know. But that said, there is it's becoming a, a more apparent taxonomy to sustainable linked finance and gold standards such as the EU taxonomy. Um, then you've got the fact that climate risks are starting to be priced in through uh, TCFD, which is not just looking at central banks anymore, but have spread to, to corporations and how they value and, and things and, and, and look at their assets and portfolios. So it will take time for that change to happen, but there is kind of changing in the way that finance will be structured that you'll soon cost more to finance a project that doesn't have sustainability objectives or goals or you know uh, metrics as, as part of it so you'll start to see that that move into the space okay let's um, Maybe, step back I, and take yeah. a look oh sure you Chung. go ahead i was going to chip in on the financing of sustainable projects. Obviously, uh, the green mark uh, lays out um, a wide spectrum of um, design standards to achieve uh, the, the required uh, uh, bare minimum uh, result. But um, let me talk a bit about the uh, MET uh, and embodied carbon point of view. Um, currently, uh, uh, and I also will be talking a bit more, representing small firms doing small projects, because a lot of all these projects falls under um, the requirement to submit for green mark. Um, and therefore, uh, and, and I would say this, this account for quite a large stock of buildings uh, in, in Singapore, where um, small practices actually do not have the opportunity to practice um, in, in, in sustainable um, design. Um, I, I'm not talking so much about the operational or um, maybe passive cooling but more in terms of the um, targeting embodied carbon, reducing the use of concrete, let's say. So um, um, the, uh, what Yvonne pointed out about the economy, uh, economy of scale is true. Uh, we need that um, to drive down the price. And as small practices, uh, when we look at uh, one house at a time, uh, it's not possible to, to gain that uh, economy of scale. And so I believe that um, we need um, a collective effort as well from all the small practices, maybe even to pull resources together so that we can all practice in, uh, let's say, uh, in, in the M MET department uh, of sustainable buildings. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to jump to another question. Do we think that systemic change, which is apparently what's needed, is going to come from policy, from a public movement, or from both the top down and the bottom up? Big question. Well, I think it would be unfair to uh, put the policy makers on, on, uh, on the spot right now. So maybe I'll, I'll answer because I, I kind of alluded to that in, in some of my remarks earlier, which is both end. Um, and again, I think, you know, in Singapore, obviously we are very fortunate to have a, a, a regulatory body that has a, a great degree of um, sort of impartiality and fairness. Um, that cannot be, the same cannot be said about other, many other markets where different uh, bodies that do regulate um, sort of different types of, of assessing green buildings and whatnot do have affiliations that make some of their decisions somewhat dubious. But I think without, and something that I, 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 I picked up on, something that um, Pan said as well, and, and Ben earlier, and Yvonne, which is, again, the whole point of, of, of having conversations as a profession is to push above and beyond those um, regulations and, and really understand what 
the value of good design is for each of us and collectively because if you look at it even many buildings that were designed um, before green mark or lead even existed that were based on uh, really sound principles of how to deal with passive cooling or heating uh, with thermal mass with material consumption um, when they were retroactively assessed whether for for sustainability even for what we what what a lot of the conversation has shifted towards which is wellness um, they score very highly without having yeah. had those codes in place so I think it's it's almost like a bit of a wake-up call that we shouldn't use it as a crutch um, to just comply with and I think it's having this conversation to me is great because you know you know you have you have um, you know representatives of top down but also of bottom up so I think it's it's working hand in hand rather than kind of just leveraging and waiting for the next code to tell you what to do and and then just kind of leaving it at that. But for that to happen, I don't want to take more airspace, is something that Yvonne would mentioned earlier, which is giving the right amount of time. If we're expecting to create innovation and value in a way that's entirely new with a set of challenges and environmental disasters that are posing completely new threats, we cannot run the same old business model at the same expectations of time and cost as we have for decades. So I think actually balancing that um, that that problem is um, something that's probably very important moving forward. Yvonne, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, actually, I totally agree um, that you know today what I see is that the bottom the the bottom the bottom up is really leveling up, right? I mean, in the past, um, the industry takes a lot of uh, direction from BCA and you know what the regulators want. But what I've seen in the, especially in the last one and one and a half years, uh, private sector is really leading in terms of um, wanting to do the right thing. So, um, in addition to construction declass, the World Green Building Council has a net zero carbon. Uh, buildings initiative and I think they've already signed on 130 uh, organizations uh, leading from you know the, the cities regions uh, all the way down to um, corporates so there aren't that many Singapore names in there yet but I can tell you that there are some of our companies that are really looking at it because it's quite um, an onerous commitment um, that uh, corporates would need to ensure that the, the entire portfolio of buildings that they operate uh, operated at net zero by 2030 and then new buildings um, 20 oh, wait, is it new building 2030 and all buildings that they operate by 2050 so that they, this will cascade down to um, a number of um, uh, initiatives and support programs you know for the designers for the solution providers you know to to meet the demands that their clients are asking for. So, um, yeah, I think it's a collective effort and um, things are changing. The private sector is uh, really pushing the government now. Okay, yeah, that's, um, I liked your line, the, the bottom up is leveling up. <laughs> Do we think yeah. that, um, that we still need a, a, a greater value being placed on the branding and the reputational benefit that would come with demonstrating best practice? Uh, definitely. <laughs> I think to be realistic, a lot of the large companies need that recognition framework. Uh, it's an easy means to communicate to their investors. So we have to understand that uh, I know there's a lot of um, pushback on greenwashing and all that, but uh, if you look at it from the, the genuine corporate viewpoints, they do need some external validation that uh, what they are doing meets certain external targets. So I think the role of government is very important sometimes in providing some of this uh, recognition of uh, best practices. Mm. There's a question from an audience member, and this comes back, I think, to what we're valuing. How do you strike a balance between using green technology in the design of buildings and letting nature take its own course? For example, the audience member says, I always think that modern airport terminal buildings are being built too big. Especially now. That's a, that's a much bigger conversation <laughs> about um, 
flows of people and, and procedures and so on. But would anyone like to respond to that audience question? Yeah. Striking um, a balance between using green tech and letting nature take its course. Um, letting nature take its course is a, is a great idea, but we are talking about like more than 50% of the world population moving into cities by, I don't know, something like 20... I mean, we have already crossed the 50% mark, and by 2050, if we don't have uh, climate neutrality, uh, we will not be able to reverse climate change. I think that's the, the target. And therefore, uh, importantly now is to build um, you know, in a more sustainable way with uh, carbon neutrality. And uh, this, uh, this requires a very um, systemic change to, to the way we build. Um, to the to the very material we use, and um, I think I think that's why uh, I I am particularly uh, passionate about um, pu pushing the timber agenda forward. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I've got another um, audience question um, here. Do you think that COVID and the impact of um, social distancing and lockdowns? whether that's on economies, on supply chains, on real estate, is going to help or hinder efforts to achieve sustainable design? Ooh, that's a loaded question, so I better be careful how I uh, handle it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it could almost like reverse in the short and long term. So, you, you know, all the videos that showed up on YouTube, you know, after a month of lockdown with uh, the canals of Venice being clear and the skies above major um, cities um, north of where we live, um, also having, you know, a bit of sunshine and blue skies. So in the short term, obviously, there is uh, a direct correlation between things being affected by COVID the way they have and in, in a, a, a perceived amelioration in climate. But as we, as we know, you know, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Um, equally, you know, markets are trying to bounce back um, after that. And there's a lot of questions around, especially now in, in, in cities, and that could be a very dangerous path, whether uh, density and, and urban centers are a failed model you know, everyone's fleeing, not for us, we don't have much choice, but everyone in other countries is fleeing to suburbs and so on. Um, so I, I think obviously what COVID, well, the, the recent sort of COVID pandemic, and it's still raging on in other, in many other countries, is it's really making us rethink the way cities, spaces, programs work. Um, I am personally, because information that comes in research scientific research that comes in is so different almost week by week um i am personally afraid of knee-jerk reactions and major changes in sort of the way we imagine the future of and you insert your own kind of special category whether it's cities whether it's high rises whether it's workplaces um, it will have an impact but it will probably not be as seismic and immediate as some of those um, early kind of videos seem to suggest it's just a matter of understanding how to deal with the information we have at hand and be able to pivot as more information comes to light i think Doesn't emily was trying to speak a couple of times did you want to add anything emily Oh, I was about to add on to Yvonne's like the previous question regarding branding, like other than like rewarding, uh, rewarding uh, com uh, companies and organizations for their green efforts is also sustainability is almost invisible when the consumer is buying something or when somebody is using. So I think that like branding with clear graphics and all that really brings value to uh, what this kind of materials bring on the table. And also, like, um, because there are so many competing materials, right? You're really not comparing apple to apple on any certain in any certain situation. So it's really good to really cut through the noise, and also for the informed consumer to make a good decision about which material best suits the case. Yeah, that's a great point you've raised, Emily, about the ability to compare apples to apples on certain materials when you're selecting them or on a certain product. So how can we overcome this barrier? And I'll put this back to all of the panel. What can we do to make sustainability efforts more transparent to consumers? It, it seems like we need to keep raising awareness of sustainability among the consumer population, but 
often it's not very transparent. What can we do? Pay. People have to pay. Polluters pay. You, you, there, there, there's a disconnect. Uh, I, I'll bring it back to waste, isn't it? You know, it costs how much to produce a polystyrene tray, how much to sell it, and then because we all pay for that disposal through our taxes, um, you know, it goes somewhere and we all pay for it. So uh, there, there really needs to be that understanding of the cost, the true cost of production, of consumption. And I don't think until, until that's caught up, because we, we are literally paying for the production of something, not, none of those externalities. So the pollution to the river gets picked up by someone else. Uh, the illnesses caused get picked up generations later, again, by someone else. The toxic waste, uh, the, the landfills, all of that gets picked up and paid for by someone else. It's not the responsibility of the producer. So I, I think the only way we can really address this is through that. And of course, then there are the circular systems which come into play, because once the cost of that comes out, you have circular systems which suddenly make market sense because if I don't have to pay for disposal because I can keep reusing or I have my technical bin and my ha have my nutrient bin which goes into the ground, great, and my technical bin can keep being reused, reused, reused over and over again, all of a sudden that makes economic sense. So it's, that disconnect needs to be fixed. Um, okay. So if I may share, um, in the product world, um, something that's really coming up is uh, the environmental product declarations. So this is something like uh, what we have, you know, the nutrition label for for food. So it breaks down the impacts of a product, uh, you know, in various ways. It's uh, carbon emissions as well as um, uh, impact to waste streams and end of life issues and all that. So I think this this is um, uh, is. There's a strong movement for it uh, in maybe Europe, US. It's uh, coming to Asia. So we've been uh, looking at that. Uh, but for us in our product certification scheme, we've been emphasizing on the carbon footprint of uh, product as a very good starting point. And we've been uh, educating all uh, SMEs in particular on it. Yeah. OK, we've touched a little bit on uh, the ethics of consumption, you know, packaging and all the rest. Let this be my last question to you all, because we're rapidly approaching 6pm. Do we need to also have a conversation about the ethics of design practice? You know, who, whose responsibility, me, responsibility <laughs> is it ultimately to target and achieve sustainable design outcomes? Who'd like to tackle that? Yeah, Emily, um, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying that like everybody on earth has the responsibility to, to um, for sustainability, but definitely designers like um, having designed and built the world around us uh, should always almost always have some expert domain knowledge. So like I really feel like designers should be have a role as agents of agents of change to educate the population. I know it's a tall order, but. Uh, Sometimes the linkages are, are not very clear. So definitely like we have to um, kind of understand what goes into the material, what's waste, what's, uh, what's, what's the topic on like resource consumption. That's a nice line that you said, Emily. Designers need to be agents of change. I fully agree with you. Any other panel members like to chime in? It's everyone's responsibility. At the end of the day, and whether we like it or not, our powers as, say, architects or as designers is not what it once was. You know, whereas before we had patrons and people would just go, right, you're the architect, I want a building of this size, da 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 da, over to you. Now there's a lot greater complexity, there's a lot greater, uh, well, less, there's, there's a lot greater. Uh, I say brief in terms of what the what the client actually wants you know it's kind of I want something like this which is like this these are the constraints so of course the designer has the skill and can do it but it has to come from everyone from the brief from the financiers investors who have a lot more power and a lot more say in design than 
than ever before. It, it, it's no longer the designer left to their own devices to design and do wonderful things. It's, there's a lot of um, you know, layers which, which kind of impact and they all need to be educated uh, to the value of sustainable design. And probably, I guess, as a designer, and looking at the evidence of centuries and decades of designers being left to their devices, maybe it's not the best idea to begin with. Um, but I, I may have said earlier, and I'll repeat it, um, is that mentality of don't wait for someone else. Um, and, you know, if you, if you cannot prove that you can't get your house in order, whether you are a one-person shop, whether you're a multinational, um, an inch it from there, then there's really no hope. And I don't want to sound um, dire at the end of our conversation, but frankly, it, it, it literally is up to everyone, but also everyone within their own kind of, you know, courtyard, just to, you know, sweep it, make sure it, you, you, you really understand what you're up against. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, I'd like to thank you sincerely. Audience, thank you for your questions. And to Razvan, Yicheng, Emily, Yvonne, and Ben, thank you sincerely for sharing your insights, bringing you all together with your diversity of positions in the design industries has been a really valuable discussion exercise. So thank you very much. And we're nearly at the end of the session, so I hope you've all found it valuable. And thank you once again for joining us.